Life Rhythms with Ryan Sky. Observing the world around me, looking inward, trying to make sense of it all. Welcome to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Sky. Life Rhythms, it's a radio show and a podcast that revolves around my personal growth journey. As a DJ and a producer, I spend a lot of my time observing the world around me, looking inward, trying to make sense of it all. I do it in song form, but now I do it on the podcast. Each episode of Life Rhythms, we feature one guest and one song or album, and then we choose topics related to both of those things, the, the artist and the, the songs that we're featuring. And I'm excited for today because I have here in the studio Tat Tong, who is the a r director for RCA China. Did I get that right? That's correct. Yes. Hi, Tat. Awesome. So glad, so, so, so glad to, uh, to be on the show with you. Thank you for inviting We've me. We've been talking about this for a while, yeah. having you on the show. And I, I'm, happy, I'm excited to have you on because you started out as a songwriter, yeah. publishing deal. Then you were part of the, the duo, the Swagger Knots. You've written, you've been part of what, over 200 songs, tons of k-pop success you've had oh we I, I mentioned it later on in the um in this episode but Luis Fonsi you've worked with Choi Savan you worked with Steve Aoki and then is, do you want to say these other ones Monster X Sheeny shiny, shiny yeah shiny these yeah, are k, these are k-pop yeah these are k-pop bands yeah yeah so you had success with them and then you were you jumped over to Sony You've been over in, um, you're over in the Asian market now. But the reason I have you on the show is because it's, I wanna talk about both cultures. I wanna talk about the US culture and China, China culture, the music industries on both sides. Awesome. You're doing a lot of cross pollination. Yep. You're, you, are, you are matching artists from various countries together and you're creating music that has multiple languages in it. That's correct, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I wanna, I'm, I'm curious to hear like what your experience has been like with that. It's been a wild ride, but uh, you know, I, I just feel like I'm I'm so grateful to be doing something so so unique, and uh, I guess just leveraging all my strengths um, ha- and experiences from from before, and you know, just putting everything into this role. Uh, I'm connecting um, big artists together, like you know, Doja Cat with Evan Lin from China. Uh, I did another one where where we connected a uh, 24k golden uh with um another artist called little ghost in china like everyone's massive and so it's a huge challenge because everyone on all sides they have their own agenda and egos and all that but once all that business negotiations out of the way then we get to make the music and it's to me it's just so so meaningful on a personal level to have um you know different languages different cultures colliding and introducing fans from each side to the other artist yeah. not just as a song that comes and goes but you know on the more personal level uh, uh from from their social media and, and stuff so you know just i get encouraging fans from both sides to get to know the other side on a much deeper level yeah what well, how are the fans in Asia compared to the fans in the US like are they still do they still love the physical product in Asia like buying the CD and reading all the notes getting it signatures and is there a difference between like the the excite the how invested the fans get in the artist from one culture to the other. I think all all fans are invested, um, whether they're they're here or anywhere else in the world. Uh, re- with regards to physical, so firstly, Asia is not one country. Obviously, it's many yeah. countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like the physical has more or less died in most territories, except for maybe Japan, and even so, like it's it's downward. It's okay. Not- Go and go up. The whole world has moved to streaming. China is a pure streaming kind of situation. Okay. You might sell maybe a few thousand CDs, but it's more like collector's items. Like CDs are sold as merch these days. It's yeah. Because not... I remember years ago, yeah. you and I talked about this. Yeah. I, I guess back then it was really a yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Well, it's still a thing for the hardcore fans, but again, it's merch. Like I don't know too many people, especially young people, that have CD players. Yeah. Them. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. I and if you don't drive, or even if you do drive, I don't think CD players are in cars. I haven't seen a CD player in a car in China. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's gone. It's gone. And yeah. you you have more structure around you now working corporate. Yep. And I was thinking about this cuz off air we had talked about we had talked about the the structure and I was thinking about like um they say cuz I'm not married, so I don't know what the experience is to be married, but they say like when you're if you're in uh a healthy marriage, mm-hmm. 
kind of like that commitment and that structure creates a sense of freedom that you don't necessarily have as a single person. Mm -hmm. So like, do you feel like there's a sense of a different kind of freedom that you have with this job that than you did as a when you were working independently? So what's interesting? I just saw, um, you know, Mark Manson, the 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 author of the yeah uh, of the Orange Book. What's it called? Uh, the Subtle uh, Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Yeah. Yep. So he he has a terrific series of, of of Instagram videos, short videos, and the one this morning he was explaining it as you know as bluntly as awesomely as he always does um when he got together with his wife and compromised and all that right i think i saw this yeah one. so ahead. it's about so he said he is about giving up maybe 10 20 percent of personal freedom yeah to gain 20 to gain 50 percent of relationship happiness yeah. personal happiness versus relationship happiness and yeah. to him that trade-off is is, is is completely worth it yeah. i feel like everyone in corporate has to decide whether it's worth it for them right uh so i guess for me corporate meant that now there's that structure which is good i have more access to certain things certain artists that i might not have had access to before and obviously i get paid a stable salary um so all those things are pluses and then obviously the minuses are i get less personal time to work on my personal projects and maybe i have a couple more bosses to answer to and stuff but you know my bosses are awesome i can always speak my mind with them and they don't expect me to be yes man all the time in Mm. fact they prefer that i'm not be because uh, that's just not healthy. And so I think, you know, at this point, I really do feel like I get the best of both worlds. And, and you know, I'm, I'm engaged in meaningful work and I'm, 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 I'm working with, with artists uh, that uh, are making good music. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I saw that video with Mark and he did have a really good point because he was saying that now that w- whenever he entered into that committed relationship, it freed up the mm-hmm. mental resources. Like he no longer has to be on dating apps mm-hmm. and taking people on dates and mm-hmm. going out and trying to meet girls and it frees up his mind to do other things and I'm like oh yes that that that's nice it definitely resonates yeah because as a as a, going back to the work thing uh, as um, as an indie creative right as an independent producer writer you don't excuse me you don't you don't always nail every project. You don't clinch every project, right? You talk to a lot of people and then maybe out of all that stuff, 10% of the time something happens. Yeah, but the, the other 90% of the time you were just talking and maybe it might result in something down the line, maybe it never will. Right. So there's a lot of that uncertainty, right? And then mo- some, sometimes like months go by and you're doing all these demos and making all these pitches and mm-hmm. um, and being with all these artists, but no, nothing happens to your bank account. And then like that creeping sense of, of anxiety of starts dread. coming in. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. I've experienced both sides. I've I've experienced the having no gigs, mm-hmm. going month to month, and um, and then now I have stability with. Uh, I have a core set of mm-hmm. regular gigs that I have, and I've noticed that whenever I am in survival mode and fight or flight mode because things were uncertain and I was going month to month, it was much harder for me to create music, mm-hmm. to work on my projects, to do those things I wanted to do to build out my dreams. And right now I feel like so blessed that I don't have to worry about that stuff. And I have more, like Mark Manson said, I have more mental space Mm -hmm. to, I don't have to worry about those things. I can just worry about like growing the show and making music and I'm so grateful for that. So it's a similar kind of a thing, even though I don't, I don't have a corporate job. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. There's, there's, there's trade-offs, right? Yeah, there's trade-offs. As to uh, like, like, as with anything in life and you, only you can decide whether it's worth it. Whether yes. it's a good fit. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and um, I didn't mention uh, we played Despacito coming into this. Yes. Thank you for that. Yes. We. I, I mentioned. Yeah. I'm going to mention it later on. But um. But yeah, that Despacito. That's the Mandarin version that you created you co-created yes uh that me and giovanni my partner in the swagger knots we co-created with uh jj lian and louis fonsi the artists yeah right so it had already come out in latin america came out in the u.s right mm-hmm. and then you made a version for the for Asian. yeah for for c-pop market and yeah. that and that specific song is what that's what led you to end up working for sony right that isn't that kind of what opened their eyes to like oh he's doing this cross pollination thing like maybe we should bring him in and do this more officially with other artists yeah I, I feel like that was a definitely a big selling point that led to sony contacting me and asking me for like to to join the team and perform yeah. this role yeah i that's so inspiring to me it's so cool to see someone's journey because like i've known you for years <laughs> yeah so it's, it's really and and it's just really cool to see somebody like you going with the flow mm. just kind of following your passions obviously following your talents but then also seeing it like it leads you someplace that you never really thought you would go, but it all seems worth it, and it's connecting all the, the dots 
from previous chapters of your life. Definitely. Like it only makes sense in retrospect, you know, when but but when you're actually going through everything, it's uh it's a roller coaster. Were there you know? any moments where you were doubting things or were you were kind of like cuz I've had some moments where I I've thought about like retiring re- from the industry, you know, like I'm just feeling like burned retiring. out. Retiring. Well, I say okay. that. I, I basically it was like there were moments where I was feeling burned out. Okay. Yeah. And I was like is this because is this running its course? Do I want to do something else? Am I getting, is it because I'm getting older? And then I realized for me, it was just mainly like a health thing. Like I wasn't taking supplements. I wasn't really taking care of myself that well. So I was like, well, let me, let me like focus on the health part and then maybe I'll have the energy. Maybe I won't feel burned out. And that's yeah. exactly what happened. Like I don't feel it anymore. I feel happy about things, but there's moments where as it, but it's also as an independent artist, it's like dealing with the industry. And sometimes you can, I could feel like, Oh, I don't know. Like, do I want to keep doing this? Like, this yeah. is, have you had that those moments? I mean, I feel like every creative uh, deals with burnout. That's very normal. Uh, like you said, the health part is 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 big. It's also recognizing that so much of mental health is also physical, and so when your physical is in good shape, when you're well rested, when you're exercised, when yes. you're eating healthy, um, you know, a lot of those problems tend to uh, go down or just go away. Um, yeah, uh, but for me, because I, I'm an overthinker uh, and. Uh, and my mind races nonstop. And I'm a planner. And I like to have things planned out. So it was really a long process for me to get accustomed to sitting with uncertainty. Because I hate the feeling of uncertainty. I still do, although I manage it a lot better these days. But yeah, so the, the, the whole process of becoming a freelance indie songwriter producer, you have to kind of surrender your cares to the wind and just yeah. be okay with whatever life brings you, even if your bank account stays the same or goes in negative territory for months at a time. Yeah, that uncertainty. Because you've had yeah. songs that you've written that sat on the shelf for like seven years or something right before yeah. they came out the shiny song was uh tell me your name was i think five years we wrote it and nothing happened to it and suddenly it was pitched to like one of the biggest boy bands <laughs> that's insane yeah do you know about like epigenetic i don't no there's something really interesting that this is reminding me of that i want to mention real quick and it, it, it's that um so science there's your genes your DNA, and then there's epigenetic is the expression of your genes. So which of your genes turns on? And what scientists have found is that when we are experience challenge or go through difficult experiences, it literally those challenges turn on parts of us that were not turned on before. So it's like the more of a challenging situation you go through, there's parts of you that are turning on. Like you're becoming more, like more and more of yourself is coming online. Mm. So if you think about your experience, like through the difficulty, the challenge of navigating through the music industry, you you realize that you were a people pleaser and you realize yep. that you struggled with uncertainty and mm-hmm. like all of these parts of yourself, you were able to, it was like a vehicle for you to like turn on more of yourself and mm-hmm. kind of like transcend that stuff. Mm-hmm. That's why... I'll just finish by saying like, that's why I am I do this. Like I told you I was getting burned out. But yeah. what I realized was that through the show, through the music that I'm doing, I just realized that no matter what happens to my career, mm-hmm. it's a vehicle for me becoming a better person and putting myself together. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. That's love literally that. why I do it. And I'm like, yeah. why do I need to do anything else? If it's, if it's, if, if there's an, if that's the net, Mm-hmm. is that I'm becoming more of myself, I'm developing as a person, I'm putting my life together. Like, it's the perfect, like, keep doing it. It's a great vehicle for that. That's why I, I have stayed. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. Okay. Um, Adobe, we're going to be back here with Tat Tong. We're gonna, I, I want to talk about more about your experience working in the China, mar- China market and the U.S. market, all that cross-pollination, what you've learned, all that stuff. Okay? Awesome. All right, we'll be back here on Life Rhythms. Uh, uh. Uh. This episode is brought to you by Mixillary.com. I'm excited to have Mixillary on as a sponsor personally because Mixillary is a platform that you can use to find and hire someone to remix your song. And why that's so important is because anybody can go online and you can search music producers, you can search for remixers, you can hire somebody. But it's like, how much do you pay them and who should you hire and what genre should you choose? And with option overload, it can be a little overwhelming to figure out what's the best use of your money. Because what it comes down to is remixes are marketing tools. 
a remix of a record will get that record in front of a larger audience. It will get that record played in venues and areas like the gym or a club or, you know, car or a fitness studio, places that maybe your original song may not be appropriate for. So it is an important marketing tool, but then who remixes it is important because first of all, the quality of the remix and also maybe they have their own audience that's going to discover this remix. Maybe they have a following. Maybe they have a radio show. Maybe they tour and they'll be playing it out live. These are all sorts of things that are important. So Mixillary is a service that will help match you with the best remixer for your budget. So check out Mixillary.com for more information on this. Welcome back to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Sky, Adobe family. I'm here in the studio with my guest, Tat Tong. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Tat. So Tat is A&R. He's A&R director at RCA Records. RCA Records, Greater China, yes. Yeah, Greater China. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for those people who don't know what A&R is, it's developing artists, right? Artists and repertoire. So we sign artists and we help them with their creative. Yeah. Okay. And... You, I mean, you've been, I, I, I'm going to pull up your IG because <laughs> I just had it pulled up and then it's, okay, here we go. So three Grammy nominations, you had two Latin Grammys, one regular Grammy nomination, and you're, you've written, you started out as a singer songwriter, right? Uh, or a songwriter? Producer songwriter. Producer songwriter. And now you're with RCA Records. You've worked with Steve Aoki, Troy Savon, Luis Fonsi. And also I want to mention coming into this, uh, listeners, you you were hearing what is yes, it was Despacito, not in English, but that is yes that you were listening to Despacito. That's in Mandarin, not in Spanish, but in Spanish Mandarin. Yep, Spanish Mandarin. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm thinking of the U.S. version, but even the U.S. version was in Spanish, uh, or, except for the Bieber part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was like blinded by Bieber, I guess. <laughs> so, is it, so yeah, you di we did play a Mandarin version of Despacito, and that's because you. Tell people what part of, of that version you had. So uh, me and my uh, business partner, Giovanni, uh, we're a group called the Swagger Knots. And so at that point in 2017, when that song became the number one song in the world, we were working with both Fonsi and uh, a, a Singaporean Chinese pop artist called JJ Lin, a yeah. massive superstar. And we were mo working on both their projects at the same time. And so one morning, Giovanni wakes up and he's like, hey, Tat, let's just put them on together on WhatsApp and see what happens. So we start a WhatsApp group. We pull Fonzie in, we pull JJ Lin in, and then we pitch the idea of a Mandarin, like collab version of Despacito. Oh, you pitched it. I thought they came to you and asked you. Okay, you pitched. So you kind of like made the opportunity or you had the idea for it? Yeah. And and so both artists like took to each other really well. And then, so the rest is history. You know, we recorded uh, Fonsi in Mandarin for the first time in his career, which was really amazing. Just kind of a, such a career highlight for me. I remember like just... Did you have to coach him on yes, pronunciations? Yes, and... because it's a tough language, but he did so well in a very limited like amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, what, when did you work on that and then when did it come out? Uh, we worked on it kind of in late 2017 uh, okay. and then it came out in early 2018. Yeah. Early 2018. And then what was the reception? How did it go? I mean, it was historic. Uh, anything with, with JJ on it is going to, hmm. to go up the charts and do well in that part of the world. And, you know, Fonsi, that song was already the number one song in, um, in the world and especially in Latin America and in America. So, yeah. so I think the co the combination was really cool. Uh, I, but I feel like metrics aside, numbers aside, charts, streaming, all that did great, of course, but I feel like the historic aspect of it, uh, not just us teaching Fonsi Mandarin for the first time in his career, but also, you know, just the whole cross-cultural element. I feel like the original version of Despacito united the world like never before, really. Yeah. And just all the different language versions. There wasn't just a Mandarin version. There was a Portuguese version with a different collab artist and all that. I just feel like so grateful to be part of that moment where the world kind of felt a bit smaller. Right. Mm, and, yeah. you know, and, and a major U.S. artist, a Latin artist singing in Mandarin. I just feel like that's especially in these times when the world seems so, so fractured and so distant. You know, sometimes it's uh, the power of music to unite. I know it sounds like hella corny, but I still believe in it. And it is, it's yeah. an example of it actually happening. Yes. Was that the first time you had a cross-cultural moment like that, personally, that you were a part of? Um, no, but it was definitely the biggest. You know? yeah. Beforehand, we were doing things with you know, K-pop bands and Latin boy bands and things like that. You know, We were putting them together. And, yeah. yeah. So once this, who put the song out? Who? 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 Like Universal? 
It's with Universal? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, Fonsi was signed to Universal. Mm. Is signed to Universal. Okay. Yeah. And then following that, so at this point you were you were part of you were with the Swagger Knots, a production duo. Uh, yeah, we're a production duo with uh, Giovanni Javier of American Idol season ten. Yeah. yeah. So you started out. You grew up in Singapore. I did. Yeah. And you moved to the U.S. I moved to the U.S. So I, I I've spent a grand total of maybe twelve years like living in the U.S. Yeah. And more mm-hmm. as you know, just a visitor. Uh, I spent four years in college in upstate New York. Yeah. And then. After that, I went back to Singapore to work, and then my second time, like living in the U.S., was um, around 2012, 2013, um, for for music. So I got yeah. uh, I got a talent visa, and then I moved over here and basically started from scratch. Yes, yeah, as a songwriter producer in the U.S. And what was that like starting from scratch? I mean. I was broke for a while. Yeah, <laughs> like everyone else. Yeah. But I'm, I'm really glad. I mean, for for I'm just looking back. I'm just so grateful that I didn't have to suffer for quite as long as a lot of my friends. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in in, yeah. in in the grand scheme of things, I barely suffered. I moved, so I moved for real. Uh, I think in in April of 2013, if I recall, and then by December of 2013, I was already in the studio with Troy, and then the next year the record came out and it just went. To number one on iTunes in sixty six countries and and yeah and and gold and all that and yeah. and so I I in you know compared to many of my friends that wait period was so short but I mean when you're in that period where you don't know if and when your break will ever happen yeah I feel like that's still you know something that uncertainty the sense that I was bleeding money I wasn't making any money I, I still remember that really clearly yeah I, I was gonna ask you about that e- even whenever you're in the studio and then the song's going number one there's a delay right be- between yes that and you yes receiving your cut of yes things. it's a significant delay for publishing because of the way the accounting system is set up it's pro it's usually up to a year mm-hmm. before the money starts trickling in um but then once it does, it continues, right? Because royalties don't stop; they go up and down. But you still get some money, yeah. Um, like every every half a year, um, yeah. So for that, for the producer royalties, I think it took about a year as well. You know, okay. Before that started coming. And what out. were you doing in the meantime to to transition or to to kind of wait for that period to come in where the the money was coming in? Like, did you have a part? Did you have a job jobs on the side or? Yeah, so before um so before I came to the states, I came to the states because I had some significant success out in Asia, some pretty big songs. Oh yeah. And had and you that, already done the K-pop at this point? Um not K-pop, but I was already pretty into that that period of time in C-pop, Chinese pop. I was already okay. uh getting get, getting number 1 hits across like the C-pop sphere, I guess, and and so that that definitely helped because that attracted the attention of my publisher. So I've been signed to Universal Music Publishing for 14 years now. Okay. And so the U.S. office that t- typically doesn't deal too much with Asian writers, um, they they picked up on, on that success and they decided to invite me over for like a chat. So I chatted with them and after that they set me up in the room with some pretty big writers including Damon Sharp who's done stuff for Ariana Grande yeah. and, and 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 Jackie's boy who at that point was working with Bieber and Madonna so okay so they made that happen and I still remember my first few sessions I was petrified oh, did you have like holy shit moments yeah I, I completely I had so much stage fright studio fright stage fright the, the <laughs> studio equivalent of stage fright. yeah 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 but they were really nice and understanding and and I feel like that was necessary, right? Because once I got over that, I'm like, they're just people, make a song, you know, stop overthinking it. So I did. And then after that, I felt like, yeah, I think I'll, 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 come, I'll come out because I feel supported by Universal. I feel like this is the direction that the universe is pushing me towards. So I'm just going to see where it leads. Yeah. But back to your question about, you know, like uh, making ends meet, uh, the fact that I already had some residuals from my more successful records out in Asia, the fact that I um, could continue to do work out in Asia uh, definitely helped. So I started splitting my time. So I was basically burning money in the US and earning money out in Asia. I'll, I would fly back and forth for gigs, you know, yeah. screw the time zones, screw the jet lag, team no sleep. It was, it was tough, but again, you know, I still feel much more fortunate than a lot of my friends who, you know, just came out here with a few hundred bucks in a dream, yeah. That's <laughs> that was me. I came out here with zero gigs. I had savings. It, it, it's it's so funny because like I'm glad I yeah. did it, but it, it's kind of crazy to think about. It's like you it moved. Is. I moved out here with some money and no gigs, and I was just like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna make it work." Yep. And I eventually did, but yeah, it's quite the risk. 
Yes. We can say fuck on the show. Huh? We can say fuck. On oh the yeah, show. we can swear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, because it's not radio. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll self censoring. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Yeah, yeah. We can. <laughs> you can say. We can talk about it. <laughs> I know. Yay! We can swear. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Did you? What did you learn about yourself in those early years? Like, um, so you were in you were in the studio with people that at first you were feeling nervous about, but I imagine you probably adapted to it quickly and maybe learned some things about yourself in the process. Well, I feel like. I'm very grateful for their mentorship because, uh, firstly, they were nice, right? They didn't yeah. just tell their publisher, like, Tad is completely useless in the studio. He froze. He couldn't even mm. program a simple drum beat, which is exactly what happened, by the way. I couldn't do nothing. Oh. And But then they continued working with me and with Giovanni when, when we became You couldn't because yeah. of the nerves or because nerves. you just didn't? Okay. I, I had number one records out in Asia at that point. I was completely capable you of doing You had the skill. Everything. It's just completely. The nerves it was just, yeah. wow, this is the big leagues. While I'm sitting in the studio with Madonna's writer, what the F is going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. What did you learn culturally? Because you had started out in Asia and then you came here. Were you surprised at the differences or the similarities between the two cultures or the two industries? Um, so I wasn't so much surprised because I had spent some time in this country, um, you know, getting my bachelor's and my master's in college. Okay. So, so I, I got that. So I got culture to some extent, yeah. which I think is, is a big thing. Like whenever you go to a place to make music, music's all contextual, right? It's all cultural. It's about what's happening there. Like what people like and dislike, how mm. they describe certain things. So uh, I got the culture, which I thought made it easier, but still I think out in Asia, the, the process is a bit more, um, it's kind of more conveyor belt, I, at least back in the day. Like now things have changed, but in the sense that people still work kind of in silos. Like if I were a songwriter, I would write a melody and then someone else would make the arrangement and then someone else would make the lyric. And not those things would not all happen at the same time. I was going to say in separate yeah. locations. And it's often sequential, right? Oh, really? So it was very sequential. It but wasn't... What's the first thing? The music? Music or lyric or, or whatever, right? There has to be a seat. And then yeah. after that, the other parts get a but it's not always the same seed it's just one of the parts is this yeah and then everything case happens kind of in sequence got it okay and to this day that still kind of happens uh for certain genres but uh out in asia yeah it still happens in, in yeah and yeah. dance music as well yeah you have top liners and stuff yeah but uh but see not even top line like top line the concept of top line didn't exist mm. yeah for a lot of for a lot of people like um when, when i was out in asia it was it was for example if we're writing like I don't know, what's a typical kind of genre? A, a ballad. So writing a love song, a ballad, which is kind of a staple, at least for Chinese pop mm -hmm. and even for Korean pop these days. Um, so uh, maybe maybe it might start with humming a melody, and then but that melody and maybe some chords goes to a lyricist. And yeah. then the lyricist makes yeah. the, the lyric, right? Yeah. And then a demo writer sings it after that. Yes. And then it goes to an arranger who makes you know, the strings, the drums, all that. Yeah. And then it goes to the artist finally and then you know for recording yeah so all that takes time to, and doesn't happen at the same time and uh, out here like you know you get three or four people in the room and you bang out a song in the afternoon yeah that, yeah that was just a completely alien concept so for me it meant uh. that everything was so much quicker i had to think of my toes i didn't uh. have the ex i didn't have the the luxury of just sitting in my room and marinating for a couple days you know yeah but there's something to be said about that approach too. I feel like the the songwriting camp, songwriting session, every bang out stuff quickly approach has its limitations as well. It does. Yeah, it's nice to have the f the freedom to sit with something, even yeah. to sit by, especially to sit by yourself. Exactly. Yeah, there's benefits to both because on one hand, when you're collaborating with a room, you've got multiple minds with different worldviews, you know having their own perspective, hearing things that other people may not hear, and then you're all contributing, and the song is better for it. But then also, I've noticed working alone is really can be helpful too, because like you said, you can just sit and marinate with it. Yeah. You're not, someone's not waiting on you to come up with an idea, you're just kind of like yeah. trying different things, you can take your time and just let the creativity flow. Yeah, it depends on who you are as a person yeah. too, like what your default mode of creativity is, what your personality leads you to, right? Some people are more suited for, extroverts are more suited for the collaborative approach in a room. And if you're really introverted, maybe all that activity kind of kills your vibe, right? Yeah. People are talking over each other. Yeah. Oh my God, this is happening, that's happening. Suddenly yeah. you have a beat and you're like, wait, but all I want to do is to be alone and just really think and craft this thing. Yeah. So 
yeah, pros and cons. Initially, I wasn't used to it, and I got too used to it. But now I feel like my process is kind of a hybrid. Okay. There are there are songs that start with me kind of in the bathroom humming something. Okay. Or maybe a, a concept comes to mind, and I just sit with it for a couple of days, or or then after that maybe I bring it to the studio, and then if if the the vibe in the room is right, I bring out the idea, and then if everyone vibes with it, then then when we finish it there. Yeah. But maybe it starts out alone, but finishes in a group setting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I was just thinking about one of a previous guest on the show, Kennedy, mm -hmm. songwriter. Um, her process is whenever she goes into a studio to record, to write, if she's going to be recording to an existing track, she doesn't allow herself to hear anything until she's actually on the mic with the headphones. And then because she wants whatever her first instinct is she wants to make sure she gets it out right so it's spontaneous spontaneous yeah. like as fresh as it can be that way she can just f figure out whatever that that initial instinct is of just like like verbiage humming no words right just kind of mumble mumbling and then mm -hmm, trying mm -hmm. to figure out what yep. what what the topic is going to be yep 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 the, the way the words sound when they when they come out kind of stream of consciousness yeah even if it's gibberish but there's a sound to those words and that can very often that informs what the final lyrics should be yeah and do you think it's the those words wanting to come forward or do you think it's just kind of an inspiration thing of of oh this sounds like these other words and then oh okay that maybe we could go in that direction like my point is my question is like where i, I always wonder this if i'm listening to a track and i'm writing to it and i'm just kind of singing melodies i don't really have topics but kind of mumbling is coming out and then we kind of are listening to what words they sound yeah. like at what where it's like where did those words originate do they originate from the mumbling or is the mumbling inspiring something afterwards you know what i mean i think it's both you know sometimes um, sometimes stuff comes out stream of consciousness that's completely usable off the bat like a lot of great writers have that have that gift yeah. right uh, maybe maybe you say a sentence of ten words, but five of them are al already usable, and then that informs the rest of your song. Yeah. Sometimes it's just words that sound. I'm I'm a big proponent, and and I'm definitely not the one to start this concept because the one that started it or talked about it is Max Martin. Uh, Max, uh, to Max, the sound of a lyric is often just as if not more important than what the lyric actually means. Yeah. Which is why you have all those old Backstreet Boys and Sing and Britney Spears records that are such earworms even to this day. Yeah. But then if you read the lyrics, you're like, okay, I get the general vibe, but in, in isolation, each line really doesn't mean a, a, a ton, right? Yeah. But it's, it's, or it's like nursery rhyme logic, but nursery rhymes are hooky for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, and the the Swedes, it's interesting to ha when they are writing English because English isn't their first language. Exactly. Yeah. So they're they're they tend to come up with combinations of words and phrases that I, I'd say a typical American may not naturally think of. Mm -hmm. Right. They, yep. It's kind of like a, a cool little advantage there because it's almost like um, if you're studying to be a musician and they say that when you're when you're new and you don't have a lot of skills, you're more likely to try something new or yeah. invent something new because you're not, it's almost like all of that structure, mm -hmm. right? All of that structure can sometimes be limiting. Yes. Because you automatically go into certain chord progressions or certain melody lines, yes. right? But the less you know, then there's kind of more of like a freedom of like something might come out that hasn't been in the world before. And I feel like language wise, it's, yeah, yeah, or knowing a different language. Every langu language has a cadence. Mm. Yeah, yeah, all, all, all that for sure. Although what I will say is the suites are very, very structured. Like there's a melodic math that goes into the way those songs are structured okay. as well. So it's it's not about less structure, it's about more. But I guess the, the, the innovation or the difference is that they don't start with the meaning of the words. They start with the way oh. the words sound, the way they feel in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, what about with Mandarin? You're what? So, what are the what are the actually? My question is, what are the different languages that you're working with with your with at RCA? Um. So at RCA Greater China, we sign um. We sign songwriters, songwriter artists who are um have Chinese of Chinese descent, Chinese ethnicity but not necessarily from 
from China per se. Okay. So a lot of them are third culture kids. They come from. They might have lived in many different places. They might have grown up like you know I don't in, the, in in Holland or you know in international school in 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 the UK or whatever. Uh, we have a writer. Uh, sorry, we have an artist uh, called Rin Kai who is currently. Um, you know, he she just started releasing. Uh, he made his uh, Mandarin debut with us, but before that, he was releasing pure Latin records. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so now we're doing this not Spanglish because that's old news in the states, but sp Spang. How would you concatenate sp Spanish and Chinese? Spandarin. Spandarin. I love. I love that. <laughs> Bro, I, yeah. I, I think we have something here. Spandrin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we're making Spandrin records. Oh, really? And, and yeah, so... Um, <laughs> and there's a sound to each of those languages, right? There's things you can do. Like Spanish is very... It's a romantic language, so it's very lyrical. The vowels are very beautiful. Uh, and that also informs the way we write, right? English is actually not as beautiful because it has some harshness to it. Mm. Uh, I think Mandarin is also kind of in that category, but also it's tonal, which is presents, it more percussive, Mandarin? Um, it's more sibilant. There's a lot of S's and SH's and stuff. Okay. Yeah. And... Um, I don't know that it's more percussive, but uh, but it, it's interesting because uh, so so for example, uh, rap is getting very popular in China, and I think the the initial impulse of a lot of artists in the genre is to look to their mentors, and a lot of the mentors of rap are obviously American, okay. but so like adapting, so they. They they might be inspired by a flow of say like Migos, but then that flow does it le really lend itself to Mandarin and mm. and what kinds of words sound good, what kind of cadences sound good? I think that's something that the rappers have had to work out, and they're getting increasingly su successful. At oh, that. this is fun! This is a, yeah. this is a new genre, new yeah, exactly, new music coming up. Yeah, and th that's why RCA brought you in, right? It's because of the cross cultural. Yeah, so uh, before RCA, because of the pandemic, I couldn't get into China. And so what Sony had me in was kind of more of a greater China A&R role with a heavy focus on international and crossover collaboration. At Sony? At Sony, okay, yeah. Right. So I was handling all all of Sony, not just RCA, um, for greater China and seeing what we could do for our artists, uh, pairing them with um, with artists uh, out, out here. So we had a few big collaborations when in my time then I... I uh, I was working on collaborations, for example, between Doja Cat and an artist called Evan Lin, uh, who did, and they did like a remix of Say So, her big hit from a few years ago. Yeah. And that was in Mandarin and also in English. Um, so catchy. Yeah. Still, I love Great song. I and then when 24K song. Golden had his hit, uh, Mood, his number one Billboard hit, we paired him with another uh, artist called Little Ghost from China, also a rapper. And then they did that version of that, which is also cool. We can also maybe listen to that later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this, this stuff is actually quite interesting. Yeah. So I was doing all that uh, all that stuff. And, uh, and you know, the, 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 the audience loved it, you know. Um, Chinese audiences got to know the U.S. artists even more, especially for someone like uh, 24K Golden on his first world hit, but even also for Doja Cat, who had already been around for a while but wasn't quite connecting with the Chinese market like she is now. Is she now? Yeah, completely, 100%. Really? So, um, yeah, but the, the fact that we had a Chinese artist on it helped to draw a different set of, of years, right? all the Chinese artist fans to an artist. And so it didn't just affect their streaming. So it wasn't that just that the song did well, more people heard it. It was that people went and actually started following Doja Cat and 24K Golden and getting to know them as artists, as people, yeah. as opposed to just a song that comes and goes. You know, songs are so disposable these days, right? They're like, it's like water. It flows in and then it's down. It's, it, it, and then it flows out and that's it. But but yeah, so like 24K Golden particularly did really well for that collab. Like he, he got about, if I remember correctly, he got a million, um, he added a million followers on Chinese TikTok from just that song alone. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's great. So that people got to know him, like, which, which makes me so happy because he's a great artist. And I'm so glad that, you know, Chinese fans started gravitating so much more to him. Are Chinese yeah. fans more, are they more likely to follow the artist from streaming or are they pass? Because in the, in the U.S. it's, it's a, a lot of passive listening. There it's the same in China. It's the same? It's the same. Uh, okay. It's exactly the same because if you think about it, TikTok and Chinese TikTok, which is Douyin, they're the same company. So And TikTok, yeah. uh, as, as you know, has completely changed the way, especially young audiences, young listeners interact with music and the process of discovery, right? Discovering a new song, discovering an artist. Most of that is done on TikTok these days as opposed to like Spotify or Apple Music. So yeah. um, 
yeah, uh, the same thing's happening in China. Most people's first contact with the song is from something catchy that happens on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. and then and they're crossing over. Yep. Okay. Hmm. That's cool to hear about Doja Cat. Um, we we're coming to the end of this first segment. Oh wow! I yeah, guess. it goes fast, right? Yeah. So we're gonna take a break. Mm -hmm. um, audience, I've got my guest Tat Tong here, great A uh, and R director at RCA China, mm -hmm. right? So we're gonna take a break. We're gonna come back, and I want to talk more about this cross cross cultural yeah. experience that you've had because it's it's really interesting. And Let's I'm curious it. to talk about the differences between the U.S music industry mm -hmm. and the, the music industry in China. Cause I, I understand they're different, right? And the growth yeah. rate and I just, Let's all the it. crossover, yeah. Let's okay, so we'll be right back. Yeah. Welcome back to Life Rhythms. I am your host, Ryan Sky. I've got my guest with me in the studio, Tat Tong, a &R director at RCA China. And Tat, I want to. I would love to get into because you spent half of your career, a large amount of your career, in the U.S. Now you're in China, and there's a lot of cross promote. Cross, not. I'm saying cross, cross pollination. Is that what it is? Cross pollination. There we go. Between the, the cultures, with the music that you are part of, that you're developing, you're mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you've noticed so far? What are the differences in the culture and, and how are they crossing over? And like, what are some interesting things we might, because we were saying, I was saying to you off air that from the American perspective, China is very, it's like a question mark. It's very alien, right? It you is, it's like a closed it. system. Yeah. And all we know yeah. is like what's reported to us, mm -hmm. but we don't live there. So I, I'm curious to hear about the differences maybe between the two industries and, and cultures. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think I want to start off by saying that, um, so so for me, my background, I'm Singaporean, yeah. so I'm ethnically Chinese. Uh, many generations ago, my uh, my ancestors came from southern China. Uh, but that, you know, after being in Singapore so long, just like being naturalized Americans over time, I think, you know, your culture becomes less, your ancestral culture becomes less a part of who you are and more just kind of... Uh, a thing in the background, right? Yeah. And hopefully it's a good thing, that, but it's still a thing in the background. So uh, I also did 10 years of, of, of Chinese in school. And so that definitely helped when it was time to move to China for real. Uh, but that, you know, going there, I, I, I still feel like, honestly, like I'm cosplaying as a Chinese person. A lot. <laughs> and I tell my Chinese coworkers and friends that, and they think it's hilarious, but also a really apt description. Wait, you're cosplaying as a Chinese person? Yep. Okay. <laughs> That's what it feels like when you're there. You don't feel yes. like fully Chinese. You feel like you're presenting as, as a Chinese person. Yeah, because I mean, I because of my bloodline, yeah. I am. I look Chinese. Right. You know, in the subway, uh, and even in conversations, if I don't say too much, uh, people don't really pick up on the fact that I'm not Chinese. Now you're just like, oh, okay. But then after a while, they're like, wait, you don't sound that local. Where actually are you from? You know, and then. And then the cosplay unravels and then, yeah, yeah. Um, but all that to say, I feel like China is, people everywhere are the same. You know, people everywhere want the same things. Okay. Um, you know, we all want a good job. We all want like stable finances. We all want some kind of meaning and purpose in our lives. We all want a happy family, you know, and all that. And so that that is common to, I think, both America and China. The two systems politically are obviously very different. You know, China is a one-party state um, that, uh, that started out as communist. The ideology is still communist, but the market system is now quite capitalist. Yeah. Um, the but they in daily life, um, I don't think that that changes things too much. I mean, I basically do the same things that I did in America. I, you know, I write music, I go to the office, I talk with songwriters and producers. Um, you know, on the weekends, I have a drink with friends and yeah. go party sometimes. Yeah. And the Chinese system. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. They. Mm, okay. Also, I was just thinking about the, the there's not a lot of they, there's no Spotify in China, right? Yes. So it's a walled garden. That's what I was just it's a walled yeah, that's garden. What I was thinking. Uh, which is interesting because uh, at least in that generation, because Spotify before before TikTok, 
became a, the, the dominant platform. Um, everything had originated from either Europe or the US, right? So, so the streaming platforms, all the meta platforms, uh, everything was US or Europe. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, there, during that period, because of uh, the walled garden aspect, uh, China has a firewall. Uh, uh, and so uh, accessing foreign content is not as easy as it is elsewhere. Uh, but then because of that, it, it uh, allowed almost like uh, you wall off your garden and then the plants inside grow free of foreign competition mm. and influence. So uh, they, they, they now have really big uh, platforms uh, like many, how, how many big? How occur. big compared to the here? No, massive. Like I don't yeah. have the the figures on hand, but um, you know, uh, we we always talk about things in the few in the hundreds of millions, if not the billions, in terms of subscribers or wow. yeah. Wow. So uh, yeah, there's like a whole bunch of platforms set up by Tencent or by NetEase, which are the two big conglomerates there, and and they um, they function just like the the platforms outside the U.S. Like there's banners, there's um, there's an algorithm that tries to serve you what it thinks you want. Mm -hmm. So all that's exactly the same. It's so it's like a parallel kind of a parallel universe. Um, but now like with TikTok and be, TikTok being like from a Chinese company, so it, it, in a sense, I think this wall garden still exists, but the lines are blurring because now the world is hooked on a platform that is really a Chinese platform. The idea came from China. Yeah. Yeah. Are the Chinese using a different version of TikTok than we are here? Yes, and in fact, um, even outside of uh, China, like uh, TikTok is built to be global, right? So it's nominally a global platform, but it's all, also local in the sense that the algorithm prioritizes where you're from. Okay. So for example, if you're in America and you're on TikTok, you'll see mostly American content. Okay. You might be able to look for and find, I don't know, Singaporean content or Japanese content, but it's not served to you as much. Yeah. Yeah. Is it hard for n artists outside of China to break into the market? Is it hard? Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, I guess, structural um, obstacles, right? I mean, the first being the language. I think, uh, you know, just like anywhere else, uh, people appreciate when you more when they can understand what you're singing about. And so even though the, the standard of English is definitely going up in China, it definitely helps to be able to speak or sing in Mandarin. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then and then also I guess the the fact that it's a really big country with actually a very a maturing already very mature music market mm. with a lot of competition. So when you go in, you're immediately dealing with so much competition. One point four billion people and a proportionate number of artists. So wow, yeah. right? Is there what about is there payola in China? Is there payola? Yeah. Um, I haven't seen. I haven't seen payola in practice. Okay. Not in in the sense that payola being an illegal practice. So everything is legal. Yeah. Uh, Everything's legal. Uh, as in uh, everything that I've seen is legal. Okay. And uh, and for listeners, payola is banned in the U.S. Yep. And basically, the idea of payola was that it back in the day, um, labels artists they would pay a, a radio disc jockey. Yep. Would pay them to play the song, and that was that's illegal now. You can't do that. Yep. Yep. So that that's for the people who didn't know what that is. That's what yeah, payola is. Yeah. So it's basically like pay for play. Yep. But in a sense, legal play for play, pay for play is happening all the time, not just in it's China. Still ha yeah, it's happening yeah. on Spotify. Yeah. So and and the only difference is it's completely they're completely open about it. So there's Spotify, Spotify's uh, promotion um, tier, right, where you can pay to have your music get some preferential yeah promotion right. on the platform. Discover. Uh, I mean that that happens in China too, like. Uh, for example, Douyin, which is the Chinese Chinese version of TikTok, has uh, has a feature called Dou Plus, uh, where it's essentially when your content starts going, you might get a friendly note from the app saying, "Hey, look, we noticed this is going well. Congratulations! Uh, if you would like to continue to get more reach on this uh, piece of content, here are our plans. Let us know when you're ready." Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. But of course, if you don't, if you ignore the message, then your reach stops. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What about <laughs> censorship? Everything's censored, right? So, yeah, everything is regulated in the sense that so uh all all content in China, uh whether it's TV content or song, uh goes through uh a, a process where we submit it to 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 the government and then the government's like, "Okay, cool. You can you can put it up." 
So there's that process mm. going on. And so there's certain keywords. Obviously, they're looking out for some kinds of content that are objectionable, whether it's overly violent, overly sexual, overly or overly political. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. What, um, so what, what kind of projects are you working on right now? And are you strictly focused on cross pollination? Is that what your job is mainly about? Um, no, not anymore. Because okay. uh, so because so Sony so Sony China is uh, currently um, kind of restructuring, and so RCA is kind of the first label of its kind. It's uh, um, and there will be more other Sony sub labels with familiar names like Columbia, for example, uh, down in in the pipeline. But um, so RCA is currently a singer songwriter label. We're signing Chinese diaspora artists, not necessarily all from China, but diaspora. They can speak Mandarin. They have a connection yeah. to the country and its culture, and uh, and so in a sense, crossover is always at the back of my mind because these artists are built for crossover because mm. they're. They're not 100% like Chinese born and bred with that worldview. They come from other places. Uh, but, so so but, by default, it's going to be slightly it, Yeah, exactly. There's, there's always going to be a slant, which yeah. we think actually gives us a competitive advantage because there's tons of Chinese labels with far bigger like market share than we do doing um, like pure Chinese content for the Chinese audience. So I think we have a niche and we, we now and we, we're trying to build that niche. Yeah. How is the structure there compared to here? Like, is it is it corporate? Is it corporate capture like here, or is there? What's corporate capture? Um, I, I consider corp- corporate capture is basically like um, corporate money uh, influencing everything, control who gets signed and what what gets promoted and um, kind of like the agendas that come with that. Uh, is for a chi- is it for a chi- Chinese a Chinese artist trying to break into the Chinese market versus an American artist trying to break into the American art American market mm-hmm. similar experience or do they have different different um, obstacles? So I think firstly, um, and this is not a point that's unique to China or U.S. I think it's it's around the world. I feel like the power of labels has decreased greatly. Decreased because uh-huh. it used to be that there's there used to be um, it used to be that uh, the labels were the gatekeepers, right? And once you're, so it's really hard to get signed to a label. But once you're signed, the floodgates open and then you have access to radio. And radio is pretty much the only game in town, right? Yeah. So when you're signed to a label, uh, the their very basic promotion package already involves you playing, getting on ra- heavy rotation to radio. Yeah. So after the whole country hears your um, <laughs> song like, two or three times an hour, they're already brainwashed at that point, right? Yeah. And so everything comes from there. And then you sell CDs for 20 bucks a pop, and then so you get that huge amount of money up front. So that was the old model. Uh, Now, um, you know, the labels are are still, in a sense, a gatekeeper, but not the only game in town. Because, in fact, I feel like the streaming platforms actually hold more power now. Mm. And... But then fast forward to today, now that we have TikTok, I feel like TikTok holds the most power because people, uh, yeah. people's first contact point, first touch point with a new song is often through a TikTok video. So um, I would say that I think the whole concept of, of, of the labels being you know, the gatekeeper, corporate capture, I think that's not as much the case anymore. I feel like an artist coming out today uh, has to deal with a very crowded, very saturated market because the, everyone's making music in their bedrooms, right? And, and just putting it directly on TikTok and then voila, you have worldwide distribution <laughs> from the start, which w- would have been unthinkable decades yeah. ago. But at the same time, you have to deal with so many people uh, so, uh, that are doing the exact same thing. You are, you're dealing with over 100,000 new tracks on Spotify every day and over 150,000 new tracks a day on Chinese platforms. It's just a deluge of content. But, uh, but all that being said, of course it's competitive, but the barriers to getting your music heard have actually gone down a lot. Way down. Yeah. Way down the, from the corporate capture perspective. So corporates aren't capturing quite as much as they used to. Okay. Yep. A, a lot of people may not realize that Spotify is co-owned, has, is co-owned by labels. Used to be more so. I believe that some of the labels have divested, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, are, any, are any of the streaming platforms in China, do the labels have... A commercial interest and in ownership of that as well in China, like they do in the U.S. I'm not sure. You don't know? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I would have to look it up. Yeah, uh, but obviously, like the labels. What about playlisting? Is that as big in China as it is in the U.S.? It is. It is. 
Okay. And you know, it's it's the same thing. Obviously, at the labels, we try really hard to pitch our artists and make sure that they have they have a leg up. But what's complicate what's complicating things is that the 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 streaming platforms in China are also content owners, which means they they have their own songs and their own artists. So they do function in a sense like labels. So, oh, yeah. at, at the same time, TikTok that, is doing that in the U.S. Too, yeah, right? exactly. So, and in China as well. So, at the same time that we're pitching our artists, uh, we don't hold all the cards because they have their own artists and their own agenda as yeah. well. You know, so we do need each other, but we're also competing. And are both sides yeah. basically prioritizing artists that are vi viral? Is that kind of like what they're looking for? Is what's what's bubbling up? So the the platforms, uh, the streaming platforms, obviously have an advantage because they have access to data, right? They they have the entire backend. They can see firsthand when something's starting to gain traction, mm. even before any of us do, right? Mm. And then uh, at that point, they can probably make an offer, right? Yeah. So so that's their model. Uh, at the labels, I think, especially for RCA, which is a, a more old school artist development label, we don't just look at that. We're not just about songs. We're about growing artist careers and talent and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I think our points of view are a bit are, are a bit different. So it's not about necessarily just signing stuff that's viral. Obviously, in this day and age, uh, because the labels have lost so much of our power, we don't have a stranglehold on radio anymore or or distribution like in CD stores like we used to. So um, the the reality on the ground is you do have to have some kind of social media thing going on. You might not have to yeah. have the 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 biggest figures in the world, but you do have to have something going on, some kind of fan base. We need to see that artists know how to use social media and that they're connecting with their fans yeah. and that their fans are receiving the music in mm -hmm. as opposed to it just getting lost in that flood of over 100,000 songs a day. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that's something artists need to realize as well that, you know, promotion in a sense, the label can help you amplify. We want to, but we can't make something from scratch anymore because fans don't gen don't generally react well to ultra corporate ads like remember People back can in the day sniff it out now. yeah exactly yeah. Be but back in the day you know when when labels and radio stations and record stores they were all in that one same system then then it's completely fine right because then you have an ad on the radio it's like I still remember those CD ads on radio, right? Where, where they'll be like, oh, so-and-so artist has a new, 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 new thing out right now. The number one on Billboard, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. And then you rush to Amoeba and you buy the record, right? Yeah. But, but that, that's just not true anymore. And so artists hmm. really need to be, uh, find ways, creative ways to connect listeners to their music. Uh, we still believe in the power of good music. Obviously, there's a lot of music that I consider not so good out there. And I believe in, like personally, in the music of every artist we sign. But at the same time, it does not help their case for us at the label to be doing that kind of stuff because that's hopelessly out of date. It just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. You are working for a corporate. You're, you have a corporate job now, right? Um, did you ever think you would be on this side of the, of the aisle? It was never in the cards. But I was because um, you started out independent. I did. I, I made producing. I made songs. How many songs? What? How big is your catalog? How many songs? I, I made, have over two hundred songs. Over two hundred. Yeah. Wow. And okay, so you never thought you'd you'd come over to? Why did you make this jump? Um. So my current MD of our RCA Records, uh, Greater China, Kevin, is an old friend, and so uh, back in 2019, um, he joined Sony. Yeah. Uh, he was an indie guy too, right? He he had his own label, indie label. He had his own studios in Singapore. He did all that, but then he was. Uh, I guess at that point, you know, Sony in Asia was looking for change, and so they started sign, uh, not, not signing, but they started bringing people into management that they, that they felt like were disruptors. And so I think Kevin was one of them. Like he, he was new school. He got it. He wasn't from, he wasn't a career label guy for like 20 years, right? Yeah. He, 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 he came in from the outside and he made a lot of positive change in the company. Uh, and so when he asked me to join the team, he gave me this pitch of, you know, connecting our artists with artists in the U.S. and being really like global minded and doing things in a new way. I just thought that was incredibly um, sexy. So I decided to uh, to join. It's yeah. so cool because you get to connect the dots between the different chapters of your life. Exactly. In a way that you I'm probably I imagine you never thought. No, never. Yeah. And then obviously after that, the pandemic happened. And so I was really glad to, you know, have a job. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. Super yeah, lucky. You know, yeah. <laughs> What what have you learned so far? What has been what has been the response to some of these crossover collaborations that you've put together, you've worked on? Like, what have you noticed? Um, what have I noticed? Um, obviously, you know the from from a pure business perspective, when you cross two artists together, you're gonna get artist A's fans getting no artist B and artist B's yeah. fans getting no artist A and all, all that's well and good uh, the collaborations I've worked on have done really well you know like we have north of a billion or a couple billion streams on the bigger collabs that I've done uh, for, for Sony out in Asia uh, but at the same time I think what's interesting to me is not that stuff because yeah. that stuff's kind of a given that stuff keeps me employed at Sony yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm employed to deliver results and I do deliver those results I keep our artists happy I make good music uh, so, so all that's given. But what's more interesting to me is going to the comment sections. Uh, you know, like when an artist mm. posts about a song and seeing what how the fans yeah. resonate. So, like maybe maybe talking about my uh, one of our current signings at RCA, a guy called Rin Kai, who is Ecuadorian but also has a f- family in China. Wow. So Ecuadorian Chinese, what a mix, right? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he speaks Spanish. He speaks Mandarin. He speaks English. He's trilingual. And he sings trilingually as well. So, wow. um, so when um, so when we uh, brought him over to China, and he's the first artist co-signed to both Sony Latin as well as RCA China, which is Sony China, right? So he's our first kind of uh, experiment, if you, <laughs> if you may, doing <laughs> this. Uh, but at the label, we, we want to do new things, right? We don't just want, just want to stick to the old. So so we're doing this, and you know, uh, together with him and a couple other colleagues, we found a new sound for him. Uh, it's kind of like it's a cross between Chinese. Uh, and we're still trying to aim for that market. We know what Chinese people want to hear, and mm. we still want to give it to them in some way. But we're finding ways to sneak in some Latin, whether it's like a sneaky drum beat halfway into the song, or whether mm. it's a language switch. So he sings his current release, which is his, his debut with RCA China, is a song called uh, "Protagonista" in 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 Spanish. So that's what that's the title you see. But then he starts out in Chinese, and then two thirds of the way in the song, he switches to a verse in, in Spanish. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, my my thought process was okay. Uh, we're we're trying to make a record that's for C pop. So we don't want to start with Spanish off the bat, but we don't want to completely make him into just another Chinese artist as well, right? So he'll get through one chorus and hopefully it's beautiful enough that you're hooked. And then at that point, when he starts switching, you're it's like good. switching channels. You're like, oh, okay, that's fresh. But you're already committed enough to the song as a listener at that point that you'll you'll just bear with it, right? And then. Like listen through to the end. Yeah. What are the comments yeah. that you're seeing? So we designed the song for the Chinese market, and obviously he. So not obviously. Uh, so a little bit of background. He's had quite a bit of success. He's he's had number one records in Ecuador, etc. And then he got signed to Sony Latin, and then he got co-signed to RCA China. So he already has a Latin fan base. Uh, when we were when we were putting out his new material and strategizing and all. For, for China, we wanted to make sure it worked for the Chinese audience. But what we're noticing on YouTube and the other, other platforms is that the initial reaction is obviously from his current Latin fan base. Yeah, yeah. And they're loving it, even though... So my hypothesis was people want to listen to a song that's in a language they already understand. That's very normal, right? Yes, yeah. But then the Latin fans, maybe because they're already committed to him as an artist and they like him and they know about his background and they think it's fascinating... They're really digging the fact that the song's in Chinese. They're talking about, oh wow, I can completely see this in like the Chinese version of telenovela. And oh. obviously, because K-pop and K-dramas are so huge now, they're like, oh, this sounds like a K-drama theme song, like from the original soundtrack of so and so. Yeah, Just- yeah. And so they're actually digging it. I've had nothing. I've seen nothing but love and positive feedback for a song where two thirds of, uh, of of the lyrics are not understandable to. Your typical, I don't know, Mexican or Ecuadorian or Peruvian audience, yeah. but they're going all, they're going along with it because they love him and they love his story, which I feel like is just so encouraging. Huh. Do these kind of collaborations chip away at the walled garden? Because you were saying how it's kind of getting fuzzy, the lines are getting fuzzy. I, I, I wonder, is there a way to quantify the effect that it, these kinds of things are having on the world? Well, the walled garden is. Is, is a walled garden because of, of, of the VPN, right? It's the information control structure of China. So um, I don't know that that's going to go away, but I feel like besides that and all that political stuff, I feel like if we focus on 
the fact that as as a world, right, we're more interconnected than ever before. Uh, you know, Chinese people are not they're not cut off from the rest of the world. You know, this is not North Korea. They know what's up. Okay. Shanghai, a city that I'm living in, is an ultra cosmopolitan city that had a, that was you know. A lot of that had a lot of European influence back then. That's why that, that there's a French concession there, which was an area that was ruled by the French, for example. So all that all that to say, there are many parts of China, plus with the internet, even with the the, the VPN in place, uh, people know what's up. And I think uh, in this day and age, uh, you know, with with non English content first with the Latin wave, then with the the Korean wave, yeah. Um, you know that there there is I think uh, uh, a shift. There's a shift in mindset uh, where you can enjoy content that's not in your language, a language you understand, that's not from your culture, but that you resonate with anyway. Yeah. So yeah. the the walled garden isn't changing, but I I do see how it can it's starting to at least connect cultures together. Yes. And I can relate personally because I don't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. But once there was once there began. The combination of Spanish English songs, I had that experience where mm -hmm. I'm now fans of songs that I don't really know what they're talking about, but there's English in there. Mm -hmm. So then I also like the Spanish part. Mm -hmm. And but now I, and even though I don't understand the language yet, I feel more connected to the culture now. Mm -hmm. I do feel like, whereas before I felt totally, completely disconnected. Yes. But now there's just kind of like because it's cultural, so there's kind of like a there is a feeling of connection that I have there. It's actually like, making me want to learn Spanish. Yep. I'd be curious to see if people want to learn Mandarin. Uh, I Well, I hope so. I, I personally believe that, that C-pop is the next wave. Okay. And just like you said, you uh, listening to Spanish music made you want to learn Spanish. There's huge contingents of fans all around the world, especially in Latin America, that are now learning Korean and listening yeah. to Korean and Korean dramas and you know following all that content. And it's just fascinating to me and really encouraging. And I just think it's so beautiful. You know, I feel like we, in this world, we really need more unity, not less. More cross-cultural understanding, not less. Like, yeah. There's just so much we could do as a species if we... If we realize that you know we're all interconnected and we should be reaching out to each other and understanding more and judging less and walling off less, yeah, yeah, that would be amazing. Where do you see where do you see things going? Do you do you have an do you have like a little peek over the horizon of where you see either music industries in, in the U.S. or China going to, or culturally, like what? Because you have such a unique position that yeah. you're kind of like straddling both cultures you're flying back and forth working both sides i think the cross-cultural thing you know the genie's out of the bottle it's going to continue uh, i feel like what what next is really up to the platforms because platforms and distribution shape consumer behavior right we interact with music differently when it was vinyls and cds versus when it became a streaming model versus now it's a short video model i think the next thing up and whatever ai has in store for us and all those oh, al yeah, algorithms yeah. that that's going to push and shape our behavior as well yeah so i think that i i don't know what's going to happen I, I i don't i'm not really in the in the habit of forecasting like that uh but um i do feel like maybe yeah the next frontier more AI. <laughs> For sure more AI. More AI, whether it's good or bad. You know, you see virtual bands, virtual artists. What about AI-generated yeah. music? Yep. And and right now, we're in the prototype, right? We're in the alpha stage, uh, in my opinion. It's not even beta because a lot of the content just isn't connecting. But maybe someday it will. Yeah. Do you think AI is its own species? There's talk about that. In what sense? There's there's talk. I, I'm, I'm seeing people, uh, different various podcasts and interviews that I... I've been. I watch, and I'm. I've, I'm seeing multiple people kind of referring to AI that it is its own species. It's a a species, a new species that's emerging that's currently in its infancy stage. But they're referring to it like it's a species. Oh wow, that's interesting. And I never really thought of it like that. But then the more I hear talk of it, and then I kind of think about because it makes it makes you question like, what is consciousness? What is a species? What are, exactly? It it is starting to meet those criteria, and it's almost like. I mean, eventually the AI is going to have its own body. It's going to be a robot. It's going to, you know, like it'll, it'll be able to walk around. It's a car that can drive around. So at what point, you know, it almost kind of does act like a species at some point. It's yeah, not Phil, quite there yet. I, I get, I get you. It's, it's, that's actually kind of philosophical, right? Yeah. What, what makes us human? What constitutes consciousness? Um, I think, 
yeah, you're a- and you're also absolutely right. I think AI is now at a point where even the the most brilliant researchers in the world don't exactly know what happens inside that black box, especially yeah. the large language models like GPT. Like no one actually knows sometimes how why certain things happen. Yeah, it's already at that point. So I just feel like that's gonna that's gonna continue. Yeah. What what did it for me was when I found out that I, I, I was a GPT taught itself a language that mm-hmm. they didn't teach it a language they had they didn't intend for it to know I don't forget which language it was mm-hmm. but it just taught itself fluent a language fluently that it was totally like unexpected consequence of yep the language model so yep. when that happened I was like oh it's teaching itself things that mm-hmm. were not intent it's definitely yep. on its own trajectory yep and so the challenge will be how we shape it <laughs> So maybe, like you said, you know, like the it's it's a species, and so we, we <laughs> shape it like we do every other species, right? Uh, when when trees when you grow trees and along the road and they get overly big, you prune them, or I don't know. Like as humans, we've domesticated animals. We've yeah, we basically reshape the landscape, and now this thing is of our own making. It's man-made, but also it's taking on life of its own. So how do we continue to? I don't know. And I wonder if it will be its own thing or if it will be a hybrid with the humans. Because you've got like Neuralink and you've already, they're already talking about integrating. Mm. So I'm curious to see if it will be its own thing or if there will be some kind of mm-hmm. like cross-pollination yeah. between the two. Yeah. I don't know. These are all questions that I don't feel qualified or equipped yeah. to answer, but it's really interesting to think about. I know. Neither of us are qualified so, to talk about so this. So interesting. Yeah. But I just get this, I get this feeling like we are like the caterpillars and we're creating the butterfly. Like mm-hmm. I just get this feeling, like human, the human race is the caterpillar that's birthing the AI. This butterfly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It kind of feels like that to me. It's so early in the infancy, but I feel like, well, it's going to happen fast. We'll, we'll know. We'll yeah. know in. 10 well, years. definitely in our lifetimes. I think. Yeah, it's not. Everything's accelerating. So in the next five, ten years, I think more change is going to happen next in the in, in the next five to ten years than in the entirety of our existence so far. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay, we're coming to the end of the show. Oh, time just flew by. I know. If I didn't have to manually edit everything myself, I could yeah. talk to you for hours. <laughs> but um, it's all good. But it's such a pleasure having you on. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. Yeah. yeah. What um, we've been playing clips of the Desposito, and um, is there anything else you want to share with people? I definitely like where they can. We're gonna link to your socials, but those of you that are listening on Adobe Radio right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you can if you can watch the full video version of this conversation. You want to go on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and search Life Rhythms. Mm-hmm. And my guest is Tat Tong. And so we'll link to your socials, Tat Tong on socials. Mm-hmm. Right? Anything else you want to share with people? Um, no, I, I don't know. Uh, anything else I wanted to share? Um, yeah, reach out. I mean, if you liked uh, anything that we talked about, if you felt like anything hit a nerve, I'm always up to uh, to chat on socials. And you know, whether or not you're from the industry, a songwriter, producer, or just like a random person out there, yeah, do do come forward, connect. Like random people here. do come forward. Yes, let's do it. Okay, thanks for coming on Life Rhythms. Thank you. Bye, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>